chapter 7 here is an encouragement here's what he saw way back then as my vision continued that night I saw someone the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven he approached the ancient one the heavenly father and was led into his presence he was given authority and honor and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race every nation every language would obey him his rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Let's sing for it together. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of day.
seated. So last month was the Nazarene Missions Interna International Convention in Clare. I want to thank Anna Marie for getting all my goodies for me because I wasn't able to attend this year. Um, every year at the convention, they hand out the awards for the churches, and I am above honored to receive the awards for you because these are you. This is everything that you do for missions throughout the whole year. Missions Priority One, presented by Nazarene Missions International to Cadillac Cherry Grove Church of the Nazarene, in recognition for praying, giving, educating, and engaging children and youth. World Evangelism. I, many of you may know, World Evangelism is how they, they take the donations and disperse them to the missionaries. It's how they get their funds to be able to do what they do all around the world. So Church of Excellence, Nazarene Missions International, Calac Cherry Grove Church of the Nazarene, for the outstanding achievement of giving at least 5.7%. This is you. Um, I know in the past year or so, we haven't done many work and witness trips because of the COVID and everything going on. They do have set up this year a local work and witness opportunity at the Oscoda Church of the Nazarene for this summer. They have not yet set a date. Um, it says, we will be assisting in renovating the restrooms at the Oscoda Church of the Nazarene. Electricians, plumbers, construction workers, and helpers are needed. So if there's anyone that's interested been waiting for the work and witness program to open back up. Um, just get in contact with me. Um, I've been in close contact with the district president, Jill Rice, and she's going to let me know as soon as they have a date set for that. Then I have just one last. In memory, I'm If to die is, excuse me. If to die is to see with clear vision all mysteries revealed and away is swept the curtain from joys which are now concealed. If to die is to greet all the martyrs and prophets and sages of old and to joyously meet by still waters the flock of our own little fold. If to die is to join in hosannas to a risen, reigning Lord, and to feast with him at his table 
on the bread and wine of his board. If to die is to enter a city and be hailed as a child of its king, O grave, where soundeth thy trumpet, O death, where hideth thy sting. This certificate is presented in memory of Bob Arneson, whose name has been placed on the memorial roll, Nazarene Missions International. Thank you. So what's the difference? So what's the difference between mission and missions? Our mission in the Church of the Nazarene is to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. This statement defines who we are. It's our calling. This is who we have been from the very beginning as we have prayerfully sent missionaries into the world with Christ's transformational love. To answer God's call, to partner with Him as He actively redeems His creation, Nazarene Missions was formed. Missions is woven into the fabric of our identity as a holiness people. It exists to establish and support local Nazarene churches around the world. Our belief is that through a well-organized group of believers, local communities can be transformed. Our work focuses on facilitating opportunities, making connections, and developing relationships through the Church of the Nazarene. Every church is provided with ongoing resources that help the church be effective in ministry and outreach. Nazarene Mission sends missionaries around the world to accomplish our mission. To make Christ-like disciples, missions has centered around the three areas of compassion, evangelism, and education focusing on the heart, soul, and mind of people in every nation. Each of these methods are interconnected, working hand in hand to bring restoration, share the gospel, and bring sustainability within each community. Compassion brings restoration, as missions promotes a full range of compassionate ministries to address systematic problems. From natural disaster relief to child development, Nazarene Missions has reach, impact, and longevity. The power of Christ's gospel is shared through evangelism. Through the witness of the Holy Spirit, the gospel draws people near, prompting transformation in their hearts and their lives. Missionaries are constantly being sent into new territories where they participate in the movement of the Holy Spirit who brings salvation and restoration. Our purpose is fully realized when our churches have the knowledge to thrive. Through education, Nazarene Missions helps facilitate training, teaching, and resourcing to build sustainability in our local churches. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We are answering this call. Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. Approximately 15% of every dollar that we give, that we put in the offering plate, uh, goes to others. It goes out away from us to the district to support uh, local churches on our district. It goes around the world. It supports our educational system and it goes to basically others and almost 6% uh, has faithfully gone out of this church directly to uh, the mission field and that's done that for years and years and years. This congregation has been very faithful in giving of, um, of to world missions, its investment in others. So I, I just want to remind you of that and thank you for making that a value. Thank you for that value being a part of uh, the characteristic and, uh, and personality of this church. Very grateful. Now, the, uh, the Father's Day banquet is coming up. Now, if you are planning... Uh, this is for the guys. Uh, if you're planning on attending the Father's Day banquet, can you raise your hand? Okay. All right. We have less than that signed up, but okay. Great. And don't forget, you'll need to sign up. There are sheets at both of the welcome things. And sign up if, if you're um, not only for yourself or for whoever you're bringing. And I encourage you to come on out. We'll want to have a great time together, and uh, it'll be a blast. And uh, kind of the start of the... Uh, somewhat normal summer season. Isn't that exciting? Yeah? No, it's all right, good. 
Um, you're also uh, spiritual gifts. We were so excited that, like I said, that um, uh, about 90 or so of you took your spiritual gifts out the building, and, um, but also we haven't received it back. So I'm going to take just a minute and read the list of the folks that haven't returned theirs yet. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that until next week. So, uh, I, I <laughs> so I encourage you, uh, please bring those back in. There's a mailbox at the uh, church office right over here, and uh, you can drop that in, or you can take a picture of it and send it in. Make sure your name is on it, and we would greatly appreciate that. Now, this is a deal, folks. This is awesome. If you would like wood delivered to your house, seasoned, cut, stacked, Wood delivered to your house. Uh, just, just let me know. Now, here's what you need to do in order to, to do that. I need you to show up with a chainsaw sometime this week and cut this tree over here and then deliver it wherever you want it delivered. Uh, stack it in a way that it will dry, and a year from August, you can start to burn that. It'll be great. But uh, if you, uh, see Tom Jurek, he's right here. And uh, uh, if you want to help cut down some of those trees or cut them up, it'd be great. But uh, let's, let's uh, spend time, Gary, come on up, and we're just going to spend a moment in prayer, grateful for the chance to be together, and let's be grateful for the offerings that he has blessed us with and everything else. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, again, we're grateful to be in your house. And Lord, as we look at the missionary arm of the Church of the Nazarene, we're thankful, Lord, for all those who faithfully give, and Lord, provide. We do pray especially, Lord, for Joel and Sarah this morning as uh, Joel has lost his grandmother. And Lord, one of the things our missionaries have to deal with is being far away from home and not uh, able to be uh, with family uh, during these times of bereavement. So we just pray that you would give that family, Lord, a special touch uh, this morning. Uh, Lord, you know the other needs that are around us. We're thankful, Lord, for the faithful giving of this church and for the offerings that are taken each and every week that, Lord, sustain us and keep us going. We're, we're so grateful for a giving congregation. Continue, Lord, to uh, bless our efforts and be with us in a special way this morning. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand together, shall we? Sing. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. the defense. 
tender of the weak You comfort those in need You lift us up on wings like strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow.
say amen to that, our God reigns. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be spending the next few moments in um, Luke chapter 15. And in Luke 15, uh, it says, or oftentimes we refer to this, saying there are three parables in this section that we're going to be looking at. And um, I, I'm just putting it out there that I believe what some of the writers believe, that this really is one parable in three parts. It's one parable with kind of three verses, so to speak, uh, like a poem would have multiple verses. And it's, it's a story or a group of stories that Jesus delivered. So these are the words of Jesus that we're going to be looking at. Now, I want to I wanna give some background. Um, we have talked before that Luke and Acts, those two books, are parts one and two from the same writer, in the same style, written uh, for the same purposes. And so Luke was a physician. Uh, he understood research, and he understood documentation, and it was his desire to write a more of a historical perspective on uh, not only the life of Christ, but the birth of the movement. Now, he calls himself a second-generation Christian. He wasn't there for Christ, but he was there recently or very quickly after the birth of the movement. Uh, he traveled with Paul on multiple missionary journeys. He supported Paul and the new church when they weren't there. And it was his desire to document this. He had all the stories he had uh, the people that he could talk to, the things that uh, people were talking about, some of which was documented in the book of Mark, some of which wasn't. Uh, some of these, because of his perspective, some of these uh, parts of Luke were talked about, but weren't necessarily written down in Mark because of the difference of perspective. Luke is like the only writer in the New Testament that wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile. The word of God had come to him. The word of grace of this Jesus, the Messiah. And so in his understanding, he understood that it was more for, than just for the Jews. Now the Jews understood this too, but there was a lot of things that they just kind of took for granted. And so he very uh, specifically went back and said, you see why this is important? It may not be as important to you, but it's important to me, and it needs to be in the documentation. I think that's a lot of the motivation for why Luke wrote this. Now, this was, it wasn't easy. It's not like he just grabbed his computer and sat down and started typing things out. This is a big deal. If you start to write two volumes like this, it takes a lot of work, and it takes a long time, and it takes a lot of materials that aren't cheap in that day. And so he had a patron. He had somebody that said, you know what a patron is. A patron is like, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci had a patron. Different, different artists had a, a, a patron. Different writers would have a patron, and that would be somebody that says, I have a lot of money. I would like to see this accomplished, or I want my portrait, or whatever. And so those uh, they would pay basically for these artists to live for a year or so, uh, indoors, eat, and all that sort of thing, uh, while they did this work. And, and that's what happened with Luke. And he, he addresses his patron at the beginning of his book, Theophilus. I believe it was the patron, the person funding the work of these two volumes, who financed the writing and probably helped with the distribution. Uh, keep in mind, what, when these volumes were done, it went to the publisher, which was a guy with a pen. <laughs> and he, he copied him down. <laughs> and so that took, that took money as well to make multiple copies of this volume. And so uh, uh, Theophilus, we're very grateful for him and for the fact that he, he funded this. Luke uh, documents in writing some historical accounts. He writes from a historical perspective and from a factual perspective uh, through research, etc. Now, uh, Polybius was a historian of the day, and this, you, you may, this may surprise you. Polybius hated fake news. 
okay? So there were, there were people out there writing historical accounts. Uh, maybe they were Roman and there was a battle and they would write this uh, amazing account of how, you know, the Romans just seemed to levitate six feet above the, the fight and just kind of walked over the army and they magically fell dead. And, and so Polybius was very frustrated that um, these fictional accounts were starting to get out there and were passing for history. And so Josephus, another historian of the day, uh, they kind of had a style of writing that was locked into research and historical fact. And just so you know, Luke, when he goes to write and the structure of these volumes, is in the same historical style and perspective, it's an academic perspective of the day, that he presents his material the same way Polybius would have, same way Josephus would have, and other noted, trusted historians of the day. Apparently, Luke hated fake news too. He wanted things to be very, very precise. So, we, we get to chapter 15 of Luke's work, volume 1, The Life of Christ. And we, we start to see uh, some of why Luke believes this side story as a Gentile, a non-Jew, why this side story is not a side story. The Jews may have thought it wasn't as big a deal, but Luke thought it was revolutionary, and he thought that it was primary. He thought the gospel in many ways pivoted on these ideas, and he had to include it in his work. So here, here before we read um, Luke 15, verse 1, here are some of Luke's themes or ideas that he felt were important. Number one, prophecy fulfillment. So if you read the early part of Luke, uh, you'll see that he was very detailed in making sure that we understood that the things that the Old Testament had predicted actually were happening in the life of Jesus' early life. And the Jewish people, uh, not that they weren't flippant about that, but they, they, they knew all those prophecies. They'd been taught all those prophecies. They, they, they had gone to some form of Hebrew school up until when they weren't smart enough to keep going, and, but they had learned all this stuff. And so while this was natural to them, Luke goes, wait a second. There's people that don't know about these prophecies. There's non-Jewish people that need to know. And so the understanding of prophecy fulfillment and the continuity of the Old Testament, the life of Christ, and the birth of the movement, Luke saw that very clearly. And so that's one of his key themes. This all goes together, folks. This isn't a bunch of haphazard stories. What God did then, what God did through Jesus, and what God's doing now, all works together. So prophecy fulfillment. Two, the age of the Holy Spirit. And that, that has to do with where the movement got its power. And the uh, day of Pentecost. And all the launching that took place as the church started. That's the second theme. And then third theme, gospel for all nations. Gospel for all nations. Did you know why, why was, did Israel exist as God's people? Why did Israel, according to God, why did Israel exist? Israel existed, God's people existed to bring all other nations to God. We read it in Daniel earlier this morning. All nations were to be received. All nationalities, all languages. Number four, the gospel was for outcast. <laughs> I think President Bush made the uh, common statement, no one left behind, having to do with education or something like that. Well, the, this started it. No one left behind gospel available to everybody no matter stature no matter if you have enough money or don't have enough money the outcast is just as uh, available to the gospel and to God's grace as anybody else possibly as you look at the rest of the New Testament possibly more so all of us all of us are, are uh, available to God's grace and God's grace is available to all of us and number five, 
This was different. He was a Gentile. The gospel was available to women. And that was a different way of thinking for the Jewish hierarchy. And yet, we see in Luke's writings, as he highlights uh, what Jesus did, the actions of Jesus, his words, his actions, and, and uh, what took place, we see that Luke goes, wait a second. You've brushed over that, and that's important. And we see some interactions with some key women, and right in this passage, we see that uh, uh, Jesus tells a story about a man, and he tells a story about a woman. And to us, we don't notice that, but that was a big deal back then. Okay, those five themes. See if you notice those five themes from Luke as you read anywhere in Luke and in Acts, but specifically in this passage here in 15. Now, I like the beginning of this. Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. Now, let me, let me just say that just a little bit differently, okay? It's just the first group. The folks that had betrayed their heritage and for money had cashed in their relationships, their friends, and their family to work for the Romans in order to bring uh, all the monies to Rome and then whatever sum for their own good, uh, those betrayers, those folks that colluded with supposedly the oppressive enemy, those folks that we don't like, those folks were gathered around Jesus and the sinners. And so how, how do we separate this crowd from another crowd? Well, we can see clearly who the other crowd is that has defined this, the other crowd. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. <laughs> uh, we should just do a group mutter for a second, see what it sounds like. No, we won't. But mutter, 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 mutter. Uh, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. That was their gotcha. This man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. Aha! And that's their insult to Jesus. And that's the two groups that we see in the audience here. Who's the audience? Well, those that believe that they were deserving of God's grace and that God's grace was a part of their heritage, who had Abraham for their father, and because of that, they had stature. Those that had risen through the religious system to rank and stature, and by doing so, the financial system of the uh, church, for lack of a better term, of their organization, had paid them well. Those folks, if anybody was deserving of God's attention, them, they would, you know, it would be them. That's one group. And on the other group were those that were not only oppressed by Rome, but those that were oppressed by their own heritage and the religious system that was supposed to bring them help and hope and did not. Those are the two groups. And it's into that audience that Jesus tells these stories. Are you ready? The lost sheep. Luke 15, 3 through 7. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent of which there is no such. Did you see some of the themes in there? It's important this Gentile says you cannot let this story of Jesus go by without documenting and putting in print. Matter of fact, this story has had such an impact, it's had an impact on art. Just this one little section. 
This is one little section that's had an impact on art. There are paintings and sculptures of Jesus the shepherd. You know, just roll some of those in all different kinds of perspectives. You know, this is an aww. Oh. And that one, that's a popular one. A lot, a lot of uh, sculptures and gravestones are actually, you go through, uh, look like that. There's a modern portrait. This one little passage of about five verses. There's an orthodox one. Going back you know, hundreds of years. There's, but have you ever thought about, go to the next one. Have you ever thought about some of these phrases? He said, he leaves the 99 in open territory. And he goes where? Supposedly into not open territory. Supposedly he goes into less open or less easy territory to find the one lost sheep. Have you thought about that? It doesn't tell us exactly where it went, but by saying one in the open ground and he left the open ground to go find it. Have you ever thought about what did Jesus have to wade through to get to you? What did he have to fight off? What extra mile did he go to get a hold of your heart and mind to get your attention, to get my attention? I think that's one of the reasons why this idea, this simple, short story has had such an impact on people. Five verses. And we see a picture of uh, Jesus the shepherd. I, have any of you worked with sheep? I know many of you have cows. I haven't seen very many sheep around. Okay. We, uh, I, I'm not a farmer. I, 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 like, I come from farmer stock, but I'm more of a city boy. I just like to fancy ourselves as farmers. Uh, so, but the, I had left a secular job at Florida Power and Light in Florida. Uh, we did two months of Hurricane Andrew recovery. And my resignation was, was set about two, two months in advance. And uh, it was 12 on, 12 off for a long period of time. And I left Florida, and I went to Clarksville, Tennessee for my first full-time pastoral position. And uh, I was in charge of the drive through nativity. Now, the, uh, that included animals, uh, recordings, um, it was a track with multiple scenes, live people. The worst job on that was um, the, the uh, cherry picker thing that uh, we had dressed up with clouds and stuff, and there was an angel that had to lean out over the shepherds like this. That was, that was the worst job. It was about 25 feet in the air. And, and uh, uh, the reason that was the worst job is because in Tennessee, you either got your weather from, like, Montana or from the Gulf. And when you got them both at the same time, you got ice. And it didn't snow it a lot, but you got ice. And so sometimes that angel would have icicles uh, shipping off of them. And so Rose and I arrived the second week, or first week of December, and by the second week, we're out on the track, and we could come from Florida, and uh, it was icing. Uh, it was, and so, so it was a fascinating. Uh, we, we were like, what happened? What just happened? And then uh, so we had animals. We had camels, uh, donkeys, uh, sheep, and uh, we would occasionally, my favorite phone call was a na one of the neighbors called and said, um, do you guys have a camel? Because I have one in my garden right now. Uh, it was during the day. We hadn't started yet, and apparently the camel had gotten out and found some things on its own to eat. And so, uh, uh, but it, it, when it started to rain and ice too bad, uh, any of the exposed animals had to be brought in. And so we were, you can't get sheep, you can't reason with the sheep. You can't just say, you know, go that way, or come here, come here. Or even if you try and uh, do a leash sort of thing, they, whatever you're trying to do, they do the opposite. And so uh, the, your, your choice was to just go and just kind of scoop their legs. Scoop their legs and, and carry them to wherever they're going to go, where you have all four legs just kind of gathered together. And sometimes out and about, they'll, when the shepherds uh, would do tie the two front feet together, tie the two back feet together. 
um, and then the sheep couldn't do anything and that's kind of why we see the one picture of the, the sheep thrown over his shoulders well here's what I found about sheep I walked into the church to get warm and in this stairwell that I walked into there was the most awful stench I had ever smelled in my life I mean it was just stingy it was gross I almost started you know kind of a throwing up in my mouth sort of thing and I'm like I need to get the janitor to clean up this whatever's in this stairwell and it dawned on me it was me it was me from that sheep I smelled like that sheep and my coat smelled like that sheep and everything I had smelled like that sheep from carrying those wet sheep out of the icy rain into the trailer uh, and they just stink so bad I didn't know this I didn't I, I should have thought through wet wool okay I had a beagle that stunk when it got wet but not like this and so he, he uses this this example of a sheep that or an animal that's prone to go astray okay and he uses this example of an animal that when it gets dirty just does not smell good is resistant and is stubborn and he puts that in this story and in this story we kind of have a choice am I the sheep or am I the savior I think all of us know deep down we're not the savior that leaves us to be the sheep and what's God's experience perspective on this this animal that seems resistant to whatever wherever I try to lead him that fights me it seems at every turn I am the good shepherd and I will go out on a cliff for them I will climb down to wherever they are and I will pull that stinky animal close to me and I will love them back into my family it's just a few verses but the picture and the painting is life changing we can't get that view of Jesus out of our minds Luke said that had to be in there. The, the Jewish people said, well, it's a great story, but we're a little bothered by the 99. We're a little concerned, especially if I'm a Pharisee, that I might be in the 99 that he left behind in the field. And we see in this the drive and the passion for Jesus that as long as there is someone lost, it is never enough. We never get to the point where, okay, it's enough. We're fine. We're good. Thank you. If there's one lost. So here we see a juxtaposition of 99 and 1. But then... But then we get to the lost coin. Verse 2. Verse 2. Uh, now, I don't mean Bible verse 2. Verse 2 of this string of stories. And it starts in verse 8. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and it loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it and when she finds it she calls her friends and neighbors and says rejoice with me I have found my lost coin in the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents <laughs> so how much did she lose <laughs> Tin coins, silver coins. Now, silver coins were a lot different than gold coins. They were a lot cheaper. And this silver coin 
that is described. It's the only spot in the New Testament that they call it a drachma. Uh, and the reason is, is probably a denarii, which was a Roman coin. And uh, it was two denarii to get into the temple. Yes, you had to pay to go to church. And so two denarii to get into the temple. And um, the Romans were going to phase out this kind of low-level coinage. And the religious folks said, we'll make it if you can just keep its value and keep it going because we we run the temple runs on these two denarii per, per people so the the uh, jewish people probably called it a drachma but here's the point the point is uh it's maybe 40 bucks in your mind maybe 40 bucks uh would you sweep the house for 40 bucks i'd sweep the house for 40 bucks would you would you look for 40 bucks yes i'd, I'd look for 40 bucks when you found your 40 bucks would you call your neighbors and rejoice no <laughs> no I wouldn't and who are his audiences again so people that are hearing it that are like you and me would go yeah I understand it's valuable she's got nine others but still for 40 bucks I would, you know and then there's rejoicing really okay how valuable is that $40 to her and think about the other audience of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They would go, well, that's silly. Well, what, what's their issue? Their issue is their money is gold, not silver. They deal in gold, not silver. They're at a whole other level. They wouldn't, they wouldn't sweep the house and look for this. And they certainly wouldn't rejoice if they found the silver coin. So the question is, how valuable is it to the woman? And who does she represent? Woman represents God who has lost something in the dirt and wants it back. And it's so valuable, not $40 valuable, so valuable to her that she's willing to go to great ends to find it. And so valuable to her that when she finds it, she rejoices. She rejoices. And she wants to share that it's been found. That sounds ridiculous to the religious leaders. It makes absolutely no sense. Why? Because of what they value. And what they don't value. We need to ask ourselves the same question they should be asking themselves. Do I value what God values? Is my value system different? Does it line up differently? What do I rejoice about? What will I go out of my way for to find? What, what will I do? What sort of discomfort will I go through? What cliff will I reach over? to go off after what God values. Do I truly value that? Jesus kind of leaves everything hanging in the air there for just a moment before he goes to the third story. The third story we'll talk about next week. Matter of fact, the third story we'll talk about for the next two weeks. But he goes from 99 and 1 down to 10 in one and consider what he does in the next story I have on your notes just a little prompter for you to think through that this week as you prepare prepare for next week so Luke and Paul were on the same page Luke and Paul knew that this gospel and this grace was available to everyone they knew that no matter what they traditionally thought of a group of people or a person, that was God's child and God loved and valued that person. And so they were on the same page. The church, the movement, hit a speed bump. Hit a speed bump because the traditional Jewish Christians were like, well, as these new people come in, we've got to get them you know, up to speed on what it means to be a Jew. And we've got to do a bunch of things. And of course, the big uh, was when they said, oh, you need to be circumcised. 
and you know the Gentiles went uh and so they couldn't quite get their mind around to use a business term the new paradigm they couldn't quite get their mind around this new covenant they couldn't quite get their mind around how this was all supposed to work they knew that there was continuity they knew that what God had done he was continuing to build on it but they did not understand the values of God and so Paul and Luke said, everybody. Yeah, but they, everybody. Yeah, but I don't think you, everybody. Everybody. And you see this in Paul's letters, reflected in Paul's letters. You see this in Acts. A big moment comes in what they call the second or Gentile Pentecost that comes later in the book of Acts. Where they say they receive the Holy Spirit as well like we did and that was the turning point for the movement for the church this was no longer Jewish or Israel centric this was we are going to be what God's people were meant to be from the beginning we are going to be those that welcome everybody to the grace transforming power of Jesus Christ The church came along. They saw miracles and transformed lives that weren't Jewish. They said, okay, we get it. And the movement fell in behind it. And the value of each and every person was established as inseparable from the love of Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus... You love what he loves. That's people. No matter how stinky, no matter how different, no matter how belligerent or stubborn. If you've come from that category, your gratitude usually carries you into empathy for others. So what could, did God have to wade through to find you or finally get to you to convince you that he loves you and also God values you you know that you know that from these stories but if God lives in you you will value what he values those that are lost and usually oftentimes depending on how long you've been a believer oftentimes those people are very different from you and me but we're supposed to bring them close 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 and show them the grace and the love of Jesus Christ I'd like to ask the band to come on up and uh Asked Taylor if she would sing through a song that expresses these ideas. And we'll pray. We'll pray at the close of this. I look forward to the next two weeks. One author says, it's, it's less the prodigal son. And if you look at the definition of prodigal, it's more a prodigal God because he is lavish in his love for his sons we'll study that together hope to see you next week let's listen together shall we
until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. of the goodness of God. So my life you have been faithful. So my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us this morning. We come with expectancy, knowing that you're going to be here. And you show up and you speak to us. And you move in our hearts and our minds. And we walk out just a little bit different than when we came in. And that's the power of your spirit, the Holy Spirit at work in this movement called the church. We give you praise. So we walk out today as we go back to the mission field that you have given us. May we see uh, those folks that you love and value dearly. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed, folks. We'll see you next week.